Another thing I like about the data and the story is that it wasn't a hypothesis I was hoping for. It actually went against, in some ways, uh, the way that we were investing our time, the way we were guiding our clients, the conversations we were having. We had been emphasizing a lot more around strategy and setting direction and motivating and even developing talent. And we hadn't had the emphasis on these two categories that are seemingly more important than all the others put together. Sometimes the key to finding truth is simply being willing to go where the data takes you. I'm your host, Tim Spiker, and this is the Be Worth Following podcast, a production of the People Forward Network. On this show, we talk with exceptional leaders, thinkers, and researchers about what actually drives effective leadership across the globe and over time. Today, we kick off our summer series entitled Who Not What? From Research to Application. I could not be more excited about our next three episodes. In them, we're going to introduce you to an HR executive who oversaw the implementation of the Who Not What principle in a global organization. And we're going to go in depth with another senior leader who fully threw himself into leveraging Who Not What for his own leadership development. But first, we need to explain exactly what the Who Not What principle is and how it was discovered. And for that, I'm joined by two colleagues I've had the privilege of knowing and working with for the better part of two decades, Vanessa Kiley and John Ott. They are the co-founders and principals of a consulting firm aptly named Exceptional Leaders. Both John and Vanessa bring valuable and unique perspective to the Who Not What discussion. For 20 years, Vanessa has been coaching and teaching accomplished leaders in a variety of industries. Her academic credentials include a master's degree in industrial and organizational psychology which ended up putting her in a very unique position. Vanessa is the researcher who literally had her fingers on the computer keyboard when the Who Not What principle was first discovered. As for John, he is second to none when it comes to wisely leveraging Who Not What to develop leaders. His practical experience is nearly unbelievable. In one four-year stretch, John had as many one-on-one conversations for the sake of developing leaders as most of us have in a quarter of a century. Not kidding, I've done the math. So now that you know a little bit about Vanessa's and John's backgrounds, let's get this series started. It's time to hear how the Who Not What principle was discovered and why it matters for all of us, leaders and followers alike. I am a data geek and I love data. And one of the things that's really fun is when what you're looking for is not what you find, but you find something else completely. And that's a little bit about how this came to be. So as you've talked about in your book, we were working in leadership consulting at the time, working with a model that we'd built from scratch in the organization and running a program to try to teach leaders about leadership. And in that program, there were lots of assessments that we debriefed with the participants while they were together. And in those debriefs, oftentimes participants would ask about their profile and how their profile compares to great leaders, leaders who we see as successful, leaders who could take the next step in their organization or who could do something more, something broader, something bigger. And they would ask, you know, do I have the right makeup? And those assessments included personality profile. It included a natural abilities battery. It included a 360 assessment which is an assessment of that leader's overall effectiveness as rated by not only themselves, they have a self-rating, but also their manager, their peers, their direct reports, those people who report to them, people they manage, sometimes customers or others. So we had all of that information. And the question really started to circulate among our team about who does make the most effective leaders and do we have data about that? So that's what I got to do was to dive into the data. So I had some hypotheses I checked out. We looked at all the demographic data we had. Does it matter whether people from a personality perspective were more introverted, or more extroverted? Because at that time, actually, charismatic leadership was the thing that everybody talked about was how to be a charismatic leader. And charismatic leaders are big personalities and they're extroverted. And so how could a more introverted leader be an effective leader? So I looked at that and found that the Myers-Briggs, people being more introverted or extroverted, people being more 
detail oriented or big picture oriented, thinking first with their heads or with their hearts, people who are more structured or more firefighters, it didn't matter what their personality preferences were in terms of who made the best leaders. So I also looked at them demographically. Like, so, well, well, but maybe in New York, like maybe in Manhattan, you need a certain kind of leader and in the West, you need somebody different. So I played with combinations around the Myers-Briggs, played with demographics, played with natural abilities, how people's brains are hardwired, how they learn, how they think, how they process information. And the outcome of all of that was that none of it really seemed to matter. The downside of which is that there was no silver bullet. There's no way to say to a leader, yes, you have what it takes, or no, you don't. Or to say to an HR department or to a leader who's recruiting, hey, this is the kind of person you need to find so that you'll have that competitive edge. Everybody's always looking for the competitive edge. How do we hire the best leaders? I still remember the night that I came into your office, V, and you had been running the analysis. And I said, give it to me because I thought we would find something. I mean, I think most of us thought we would find something. And so whether it's personality to the whole of leadership or personality to part of leadership or natural ability to whole or part or some combination thereof, surely somewhere in here, there's a correlation. <laughs> and I remember, I remember that nobody else, it was in the evening time. Most of the people had cleared out of the office at that point. And I've got the results and there's nothing. <laughs> and I remember being oddly satisfied with that only because we were getting enough questions from our clients. At least I could say, look, we've run the numbers. We've looked at this statistically and there isn't a slant. None of these things make you a particularly more effective or less effective leader. So, you know, that was the point where I said, okay, got up out of the chair in front of your desk, which I can still see very vividly. And I get to the doorway and you say, but there was something. And I'm like, all right, what do you mean? So what was the something that SPSS was telling you that we weren't looking for? Well, the something was my last ditch effort to just dump everything in and uh, see what comes out of it. So I dumped everything in without a hypothesis. Usually there's some hypothesis that you're testing with the data. And I had no hypothesis. And it was just, let's just see what comes out of it. And often what comes out of it is nonsensical or spurious, which is a fancy word of saying an unrelated thing. You know, you get correlations that don't actually mean anything. But what came out of it was that there were certain questions, certain items on our 360 assessment that together counted for a significant percentage of the variability in overall ratings. But what that really means is that there were a few questions that predicted people's overall leadership effectiveness. So when those questions moved up, the questions across the board, generally speaking, moved up. When those questions moved down, generally speaking, the ratings on everything else moved down. Is that a fair way to say it? Yeah. What the data revealed is that there were a few items on the 360 that had the biggest effect on people's overall leadership. When they did these things well, they seemed to score better overall as perceived by their boss, their peers, and the people who report to them. We took out self-ratings, by the way, and we took out the ratings from others because they're more volatile ratings. So taking out a person's self-awareness, if we just look at overall how they're viewed by the people who work most closely with them in the organization, then scoring well on these particular items accounted for a vast majority of their overall effectiveness. When they didn't do well, they scored poorly overall. When they did well on these particular items, they scored better overall. I'm thinking of some numbers here. Initially, we had about 2,000 data points, and that correlation was just under 70%. And then years later, you had 10 times the data points. And, and I remember thinking that the correlation was going to go down. I remember thinking that these like really, really highly correlated answers, uh, that there were probably some outliers in that original data set of 2000, and that as we expanded the data set, that 20,000 data points would mute that connection just a little bit, and the opposite happened. It went from just under 70% to 77%. So with 10 times the data points, the connection between a couple of categories in our leadership assessment was actually stronger 
not weaker. Now, I just have to remind everybody here for a moment that John Ott is still on this discussion. John, you're a part of this discussion for a reason because you have been an ardent supporter and practitioner and helping people to be in this dialogue. But you were not at the consulting firm when we were originally doing this research. So before we we play a little game with the eight categories here, is there anything you want to interject as you're walking down memory lane of events that you were not personally involved in? What's coming up for me as I listen to the two of you is I'm picturing the first conversation, Tim, you and I ever had when you shared this data with me. And I'm remembering how it was for me to hear about this for the very first time. And it was watershed for me. And then the other thing that I'm remembering is I'm specifically remembering talking with you on a drive home from work. This would have been 12 years ago, something like that. And we're on the phone and I'm driving in circles around my neighborhood because I can't pull into the driveway yet because we're in the middle of the conversation. And I am pressing you up and down about the story of the data. And like, really, really, where did this come from? Help me to really understand this. And you were telling me that story. And that's what I found myself thinking about. So what I'd like to do now that we've set up that there was data and then even more data and stronger correlations, I'd like to share with the audience, what were the eight aspects of leadership that we were measuring? And we'll do this in a little bit of a, a game fashion. This is something that that I do with our clients all the time before they're aware of what the story is, the, what, what the data says. But it gives us a chance to, to look into kind of how we view leadership. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to read off the eight categories that we were measuring on that Leadership 360. And as you're listening, be aware that two of these eight are responsible for 77% of the variability on our leadership assessment. So you're looking for those two. I often tell people, think of a pizza. If a pizza was split up into eight pieces, and most of the time you want the pizza split up in equal pieces, you know what that pizza would look like. And any two pieces of pizza should just be worth a quarter of the pizza, 25%, if they're all split equally. But imagine now a pizza where two of the slices take up 77% of the pizza. Those are two really big slices of pizza. And the fact of the matter is that's what the data revealed. The data revealed that two of these eight areas were far more responsible for the movement on the entire assessment than the other six combined. So here are the eight things that we were measuring on our Leadership 360. Set direction, think strategically, align resources, motivate and inspire, others focused, execute and follow through, inwardly sound, and develop talent. So as you hear that list of eight, for many people, and they're saying, okay, what is most critical about leadership? What are the two that, that make up three quarters, if I'm rounding a little bit, three quarters of leadership? So V, since you were the one literally putting your fingers to the keys, why don't you be the one to share which were the big two? I'll actually share one step beyond that, which was I didn't run the categories. Initially, I just ran the questions. And so the really cool part is that the questions that were most meaningful grouped into these two categories. So there were 40 questions overall, and then there were a subset of questions that ultimately could be categorized in these two areas, but you weren't measuring for the eight categories. You were looking at all 40 questions to say, are there any correlations between any of these questions? Is that, is that the right way to say it? Sort of. So it's, are there any of these questions that account for more than their representative amount of influence? To use your word influence again, it's, are the pizza pieces even or not? And if they're not even, which ones are bigger? And the answer was that there are a handful of them that are bigger and they are all the questions that were in two particular categories. And those two categories are inwardly sound and others focused. Inwardly sound and others focused. So we're just going to keep going on the historical story here a little bit. It may be tough to go back in time because of all the years now that we've had to work with this, but 
you dump all of the data in and said, fine, I've got no hypothesis, SPSF software. Can you find anything? Maybe you will, maybe you won't, but here's everything. And then it comes back and it's showing you something and showing you something meaningful. Do you remember what your initial reaction was while you were sitting at your computer looking at this data? I do. And it actually was a gut drop and not in a good way because what we were emphasizing in our leadership was something else. So it gave me that pause around, hang on a minute. Again, this is another thing I like about the data and the story is that it wasn't a hypothesis I was hoping for. It actually went against, in some ways, uh, the way that we were investing our time, the way we were guiding our clients, the conversations we were having. Now, it's not counter to that. This was part of our leadership model. But we had been emphasizing a lot more around strategy and setting direction and motivating and even developing talent. And we, we hadn't had the emphasis on these two categories that are seemingly more important than all the others put together. It's kind of like we were putting the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. They were all there, but there were certain things that were more critical than others. Now, we'll move forward a little bit in time. But before we do that, I want to come back to you, John. So you are an enthusiastic participant in this work, and you've talked a little bit about first introduction, but what would you add in for where we are in the story here? You asked Vanessa, do you remember how you felt and what you thought when you first saw these results come back on the computer screen? And she said, my stomach dropped, like not in a good way. And I'm curious, V, were there any other early or initial thoughts or feelings that you had? What immediately followed from that feeling was the next question is, what do we do with this? What do I do with this? And my role in the organization was one where I was responsible for the quality control and consistency of what was going out the door, but I was not in charge of the people and of business unit. And so having the, the question run through my mind of just what's next? Do we change everything we're doing? Do we not talk about this? What do we do? I don't know. And it's one of the reasons that it wasn't the first thing I said when Tim came in the office. Right? When Tim walked into the office, the first thing I said is, none of these things are it. And then he's getting ready to leave. And I'm like, well, but there's this other thing. And that's the part of me that has the integrity part that's like, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know if I even like this. I haven't thought about the implications of this in terms of what it would mean for leadership or all the things we've come to see and understand now about how foundational these two aspects are to overall leadership. So I hadn't had a chance to, to process all of that. There's an implication in, in kind of what you're saying. I'm realizing as I'm listening to you that as somebody who understands the data that you were looking at and, and what was coming back from the software, for you to not look at it and go, well, I guess that's kind of suggestive. Like there was something about the way it came back that you're like, whoa, this is coming back in big, bold letters with underlines. This is statistically significant. I mean, for it to have that effect, for it to have your stomach drop, I'm guessing it had to come through loud and clear. Yeah, it was absolutely loud and clear, John. And I think part of it is that it was the items and not the buckets initially. We called them buckets, you know, these categories of leadership. When I say items, that's a data word for questions. Because even that, if there were a handful of things that predicted overall effectiveness, you would, I would have expected that they would exist across a variety of topics, that a person who was good at thinking strategically and setting direction and communicating effectively, that some pieces of that together, somehow that package would make an overall effective leader. That's what I believed at the time. And so to have it all point so strongly to two facets and the fact that it was 69% of the overall variability. And the rest of the pie is the other six. Like those are tiny slivers. And we were investing so much time in those tiny slivers. It felt like a really important finding. But it's another reason that we did the confirmatory analysis once we had more data. Is okay, now that we have more data, let's find out if that just happened to be with the leaders that we had in our database at the time. And now that we have a broader pool, we have more la leaders, we have more leaders from different levels in the organization, we've been doing this over a longer period of time, maybe we'll see that it's not that big of an impact. And of course, we found the opposite. Just for folks who might be wondering, kind of overall, I, I feel like there are times 
you know, if you look at a newspaper online, like USA Today will run an infographic in the bottom right corner where they surveyed 16 people, as it feels like, you know, so the significance of 20,000 data points. Talk about that a little bit, Vanessa, from a statistical analysis and research standpoint. So what you find with more data points is that outliers, those few random cases that don't match the trend, have a bigger impact when you have fewer data points. And so what that means statistically is that when you have not very many data points, the correlation has to be a lot stronger in order to be what's called statistically significant. For something to be statistically significant, when you have a small data set, it has to have a lot of consistency. The correlation has to be very, very strong because outliers can have a bigger effect. As you get more and more and more and more and more pieces of data, your statistical significance actually says that you don't have to have as close of a correlation in order to still be statistically significant. Because you expect when you have 20,000 data points, you're going to have some data points that are pretty far to the left, some that are pretty far to the right, and you're going to still have some in the middle. But you're going to have more of those outliers, more of those things that would flatten the curve and spread it out. So that's what we would have expected. And it could have still been statistically significant with a much lower correlation. So I expected to still see significant data, but to see the correlations go down, to see the influence that these two areas have on overall leadership to be less than 69%. Still important, still valid, but maybe something closer to 40. And so that's still statistically significant. It's still something to talk about. It's really interesting when you put it that way. 40% would have been a story. It wasn't 40. In the end, it was 77. Would it be accurate to say that as we looked at the whole of the Leadership 360, those 40 questions, that 77% of the variability on the whole of the assessment was attributable to questions from these two categories, inwardly sound and others focused. Absolutely. You could also think of it in terms of prediction, that if you score high on these, I can predict with relatively high accuracy, maybe 77% or so, right? So relatively high accuracy, how your overall leadership picture looks. And if these are low, I can predict with relatively high accuracy also how your overall leadership picture looks. There's so much importance to that. And I want to share a thought here. And then John, I want to come to you for for some color commentary. I will admit kind of going back into my own experience with this, that I remember that night in your office and talking through this and frankly, not being clear on what to do with it. It felt very important, very significant, pardon the pun but didn't really know exactly what it meant or exactly what to do with it. And so I eventually left the firm and I was at another company, not even working in leadership development anymore, but markedly neglecting what I was supposed to be doing that afternoon. And for me, there was a moment that created a a verbiage around this that Even though we'd had the data three years earlier, I didn't have that short, succinct way of talking about it. And it was in that moment, this little light bulb goes off in my head. I almost run down the hallway to the office of my mentor and said, hey, I think this is what this means. And so for me in that moment, it was getting to that articulation that inwardly sound and others focus. When you compare it to the other six things, and I'll just read them off again here just for comparison. Set direction, think strategically, align resources, motivate and inspire, execute and follow through and develop talent. There's nothing bad about that list of six things when it comes to leading well, but they have a different quality to them when you compare them to inwardly sound and others focused. And that was the moment where for me, it was like, oh, the two that are moving the dial more than anything else are about who you are and the other things are about what you do. And so that was kind of the moment where everything kind of coalesced into, at least for me, a clear message, which was this thing that we now call the who, not what principle. And of course, John, you have been a practitioner in this for a long time now, meaning developing leaders, hosting conversations with people, drawing them in to think beyond the things that leaders do and helping them to look in the mirror about who they are. So, I mean, you've introduced the who, not what principle. And the ideas behind this research 
I'm guessing, more times than you could possibly even remember at this point. And I'm wondering, as you think about those initial conversations, the hundreds, maybe even thousands of initial conversations you've had with people to point out where this data points to, if you were to summarize those or think about them, like what are the reactions that you see? What are the things that sometimes people get hung up on? Has it been a general agreement or this is the craziest thing I ever, I've ever heard? What has that been like from your perspective? I'm not much of a, of a statistics guy, but I can tell you confidently that of the hundreds of people I've talked to about this one-on-one, I could count on one hand the number of people who've been like, I, I don't know. Everybody I've talked to has some experience of like, wow, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think when they say it, like it, it makes sense of their own experience of being led. And it's, it's like one of those things in life that seems to be hidden in plain sight. So what happens in the next step then? Because there's an implication here, right? If being inwardly sound and others focused, if who you are is responsible for 77% of your effectiveness as a leader, there's a very clear implication that if we want to be really effective leaders we're going to work, have to work pretty hard on who we are. And I mean, that's kind of that natural next step. How do people respond to that? Are the people that are nodding their head, this totally makes sense. Are they as enthusiastic about the prospect of what comes next? That's a good question. There's a couple of common experiences. One of the common experiences is when people first grasp that being inwardly sound and others focused accounts for three quarters of a leader's effectiveness, it makes sense of their experience of being led. It's like, yep, I can see that I've been led by people who are not inwardly sound and others focused. Almost everybody's had the experience of being led and influenced by someone who is, and it makes sense of that experience. But when the conversation pivots to them personally, a pretty common experience is like, in a way, it's kind of hard for me to believe that my leadership effectiveness hinges on being inwardly sound and others focused. It's like, surely it's about something that I do. It can't just be about that, right? It's like, well, I mean, the data is what the data is, you know, and it's not so much like it's a disbelief of that the insight isn't valid. There's something about looking in the mirror and going, really, really, this is what's going to drive my leadership effectiveness? Because there's such a press and culture at large to think that it has to be about something else. And if and when these kinds of things ever get talked about, they get relegated to the category of soft skills. They get relegated to the category of like, well, character counts. It's like, yeah, character counts in the margins, but we got work to do. And so you can't tell me that being inwardly sound and others focused is what's actually going to drive our organizational results. It's not going to drive employee satisfaction or employee engagement or customer satisfaction or those kinds of things. Surely I've got to go read the next book on execution if I'm going to be a really effective leader. So that, that, I think that's one common experience. And, and I hope I'm conveying that well, because it's not a disbelief in the idea. It's like a, could this really be true for me and for the people I lead? And could it be true in my context? So that, that's one. The, the other thing is, and this is really common. It's the question of, okay, so what does that mean? It's like, yeah, uh, okay, I got the gist. I got the idea. I've got the impression that being inwardly sound and others focused is what accounts for three quarters of my effectiveness. But what does that mean? Uh, it's so interesting to see people really hungry for a definition of those terms. One other thing that with that I think we see a lot is that people will condense inwardly sound and others focused into a construct like being a good person. Someone is or is not a good person. And that's just sort of who you are. And really in the question of to what extent is that something that we can address? To what extent is that something that I would continue to develop. Either I have it or I don't have it. How do I find out if I have it? And now after having been a leadership advisor and consultant for a very long time now, how do you respond to those questions in terms of, well, fine, that's true, but aren't we pretty well baked by the time we hit 30 years old? And isn't that really the end of the story? And is this really just about you're a good person, you're a bad person? How do you respond to that now when you're interacting with your clients and talking with them about where this data should take us? With a question, I just say, okay, let's think about this together for just a minute. Where were you 10 years ago today? Who were the significant people in your life at that point in time? What did your bank account look like? Just help them anchor in that period of time and say, are you the same person today that you were then? No, I'm not. Well, I mean, like there's parts of me that are the same, but like, no, I'm, I'm a different person for better or for worse. Well, I think some of 
both, but mostly for better. And I said, so did change happen over the last 10 years? Like, yeah. Do you think change will happen over the next 10 years? And it kind of come around to the point of like, change is really inevitable. It really is more the question of to what extent do you want to participate in your own change? I've never, 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 never. And, and it would be in the hundreds of people at this point. Never asked somebody that question about, have you changed in the last, never had anybody say no. So one last thing I want to touch on before we wrap up is I think about my own progression with this data, what it says, what it implies. I think early on, it was a little bit like, okay, what is this actually saying? And then over the course of years, literally years, it's like, well, we got to that, John, you taught me this phrase and I'm not sure where you learned it, but we got to the simplicity that's on the other side of complexity. We went through trying to figure out what it all means and you land at a, at a short phrase that summarizes it called who, not what. But ultimately, there's another question, I think, that has been challenging to me, or at least was really early on, which is why? Why is this happening exactly? I mean, it's fine to make a, an observation, even a scientific one, but looking at and discovering the existence of something does not necessarily explain why it is there. And I think for me, that was a missing piece for me for a number of years. And then I just started listening to people tell their own stories. And what became apparent to me was essentially a connection between these two things that we're talking about, being inwardly sound and others focused, and the trustworthiness of the leader. From that point, it became much easier to see the connection. Because what I've discovered over time is that when we are following trustworthy leaders, we are more engaged. And when we are more engaged, there's you know, over 300 studies worldwide that connect engagement to achievement, engagement to results, engagement to performance. And then the why became almost pretty obvious to me, I guess I would say, is that if I'm following a leader who's inwardly sound and others focused, I trust them more because they're trustworthy. And when I trust them more, I bring more of who I am. And that is the equivalent of engagement. When I bring more of who I am and I'm engaged, I produce a better result. And so that rather simple why took a little while to emerge for me. But I wonder in your own experiences, whether speaking from the stage or privately one-on-one -on -one with leaders, how important has it been and maybe it hasn't been, but as people have encountered the data and you start to dig in with them about why, like what's the construct that's actually happening here that has an impact on results? How have people responded to that idea that who you are impacts trustworthiness, that impacts engagement, that impacts results? As you have talked with people about that, are they accepting of that? Does it matter? Just what's been both of your experiences in, in walking people through the why? My experience, and I'm curious to hear what John will say, my experience is that they come to it pretty quickly and naturally. If I just ask the question in the room, why? Why would this be the case? As you look at your own experience of being led, as you look, you know, John named the desire sometimes to understand what it means to be inwardly sound and others focused, what those attributes of a leader are, that a leader who possesses these attributes, who is inwardly sound and others focused, people will say, I trust them. And so what? Well, if I trust them then, and they'll talk from their own experiences quickly and regularly. But again, I would uh, echo here what John said. It's, it's much easier, I find, when people are looking back. So looking at my own life, looking at people who have led me and seeing how, if I trusted them, how that affected me and my behavior and the results that they got as a leader. I think because it's such a sensitive topic, it can be more challenging to think of it the other way. To what extent am I trustworthy? To what extent do people trust me today? Is a harder question. So that's not usually the way we start the conversation, but certainly is part of the conversation that we get into as we begin working with leaders. Gosh, you, you've just jogged a memory for me that is so obvious in my own life, V. I can't believe I never thought about it before, but there was a huge point in my life where I moved across the country to a city where I knew no one to an industry that I had zero experience in. And I did that specifically for the purpose of working in an organization that was being led by an exceptional leader. And then I think about some of the other leaders in my life that don't fit that exceptional leader category. And if they had invited me 
to move across the country to a city that I had never been in, they couldn't have said anything that would have gotten me to say yes to that because I didn't trust them. And yet with this person who is very trustworthy, I did that. You think about what are the actions that followers take when they trust the leader? I was like, well, I packed up my entire life and started doing something I'd never even considered doing in a place where I knew no one. And, and that's a pretty dramatic response that comes I mean, it's completely funded out of trust. Nothing else. Nothing else but the trustworthiness of the leader. John, how about for you? Uh, Same question as as for V. As you dig into some of the why, what are some of the things and and reactions you hear as as we go beyond just the fact that the who, not what principle exists, but why does it exist and how does all this fit together? So I'm right in line with Vanessa, that most people, it's so intuitive, it's so clear that they're like, well, yeah, of course. and Leadership is not an end for them. It's a means to an end. Like they, they have a job to do and leadership is part of what helps them get that job done effectively with the people that they lead. And so I say that because here's a, a little analogy. A lot of us drive cars, but not very many of us these days know how to fix cars. And we don't have a curiosity about how cars work. We don't want to know how to fix cars. We just want the car to work. And, and the reason I say that is because Tim, me and you and Vanessa and, and others are, we're really curious about the nature of leadership effectiveness. We're curious about what's happening under the hood. And we have a deep curiosity about that. We followed it as far down as we know how to follow it. And we keep going. Not every leader has that level of interest in the inner workings of leadership. And that's okay. Also known as this particular episode of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Could be called... Welcome to the deep, dark hole of data or whatever you want to call it. And I say that in part to say for all of us, this would be true of all of us. The insight comes and then it's about remembering the insight and staying with it, you know, because we get distracted by all the things that are going on. But what I also want to say is every now and then I come in contact with a leader who also shares the same kind, the same depth or the same type of curiosity that the three of us have. And Vanessa and I had a conversation with one of those leaders and he said, he was so perceptive. First of all, he said, I've been in the business of deconstructing leadership models for over 20 years. It's what he does because he's on a quest for what's true. And he looked at this leadership model. He says, I can't deconstruct this. He says, I think as far as I can tell, this is representing what is actually true, which was a big thing to say. And then he said, and it occurred to me that the hinge point or the inflection point of leadership effectiveness is about trust. And he said, and this is about becoming trustworthy. That's why trust doesn't show up in the leadership model. Whoa, you said that really well. I'm going to take that and say it to other people, which I'm doing right now. So now you know what the who, not what principle is, how it was discovered and why it matters. One of my favorite parts of the story to this day is that we were not looking for it when it showed up. In a way, it feels like who, not what chose us. And ever since it did, Vanessa and myself, and then adding in John and others over the years, have been helping leaders and organizations understand it and apply it in their leadership development. Of course, you can read in even greater depth and detail about the who, not what principle in the book titled, The Only Leaders Worth Following, which I enthusiastically endorse. Having said that, I want to invite you to our next episode in the three-part series called Who Not What? From Research to Application. As you could guess from the title, we are now going to move from the research to its application, and we're going to do so on a global scale. In our next episode, we will hear from an HR executive who watched Who Not What? be applied in leadership development at the top levels of a publicly traded multinational manufacturing company. You won't want to miss that conversation. Until then, I'm Tim Spiker, reminding you to be worth following. And be sure to follow us wherever you engage with podcasts. If you've heard something valuable today, please share our podcast with your colleagues and friends. And if you're up for it, leave us a five-star review. Thanks for listening.